body in Jesus oh, a long a long time ago the pain and the suffering oh I heard a lot of pain and war Some of my friends oh, oh, but they didn't Understand when I told them I can't even walk Without Jesus Holding my, holding my, holding my hand Oh, oh I can't Today, 
Our Bible background is going to be coming from 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 27, and then the 14th chapter is the first verse. Our printed text is going to be coming from 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verses 1 through 13. And our devotional read is going to be coming from Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 9 through 21. Aim for change. By the end of this lesson, we will define Paul's understanding of love as the apex of a spirit-led life. Appreciate love as motivation to share our God-given gift and act in love when sharing our God-given gift. Let us do our devotional reading again. It's going to be coming from the book of Romans. Romans, the 12th chapter, verse number 9 through 21. And begin with verse number 9. And I'll be reading in the New King James Version. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kind and affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, giving to hospitality, bless those who persecute. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. And verse number 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let us pray. Father, we come now in the name of Jesus. Father, just give me a thanks. Just give me an honor. Just give me a praise and just give me glory for you being the great God. Now, Father, by your spirit, O oh God, we just ask that you would take total control of this Sunday school lesson, O oh God. And God, that you, O oh God, would let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be accepted in your sight. For you are our strength and our wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, our Sunday school's title this morning is Love Divine. Uh, but before we jump into the lesson, it's important that we do give a little bit of background, uh, uh, a little bit of background of what's going on relative to the time in which Paul is writing this letter. Paul spent um, about 18 months in the city of Corinth while he was on his second missionary journey. Uh, this letter uh, was actually penned in about 56 AD when he was on his third uh, missionary journey. And uh, let's just read a little bit about what's going on during the time uh, in the city of Corinth, which is in the southern part of Greece. Corinth, the most important city in Greece during Paul's day, was a bustling hub of worldwide commerce, degraded culture, and idolatrous religion. There, Paul founded a church, 
And two of his letters are addressed to the church of God, which is at Corinth. First Corinthians reveals the problems, pressures, and struggles of a church called out of a pagan society. Paul addresses a variety of problems in the lifestyle of the Corinthian church, factions, lawsuits, immorality, questionable practice, abuse of the Lord's Supper, and spiritual gifts. In addition to the words of discipline, Paul shares words of counsel in answer to the questions raised by the Corinthian believers. Now, uh, we're going to read our printed text, and then we're going to go and uh, elaborate on each one of those. So we're going to go, again, it's 1 Corinthians ver uh, chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. And this is going to be coming from the King James Version. Um, so let us read. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tingling cymbal. Verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding of all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profit me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, that then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. And I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For we see through a glass darkly, but when face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. And verse number 13, which is our focal verse for today. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. And I just want to emphasize here uh, in the King James Version, uh, the word charity, uh, it, is, it is love. And uh, in the Greek, that love is a agape love. It's an it's a unconditional love. The, the love that God has towards us, it is unconditional. Um, verse 6, number 1. It reads, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tingling cymbal. The thing that I want us to get today, that love is the principal thing. Uh, no matter what we're doing, especially when we're when you're talking about kingdom work, uh, we should not be motivated by the duty or responsibilities. The, we should be motivated by love because God is love. Um, the whole Bible, the, the Christian experience, uh, the Christian journey. Uh, it, it really hinges on John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, the scripture also tells us that while we were yet sinners, you know, uh, he died for us. We, while we were yet sinners, while we were yet messing up, God sent his son into the world to die for our sins that we might be redeemed back by him. I just want to point out that love covers a multitude of sins. I just want you to know that love conquers all and that love does triumph over evil. No matter what we see or no matter what we uh, experience in life, you know, uh, many of us have been done uh, unjustly. But as we read in our devotional reading on today, it says, vengeance is not mine. Vengeance is the Lord. It says, repay no man evil for evil. So while we're on this Christian journey, you know, we are in a perfecting process. Uh, we're, we are in the process of becoming more and more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the example that uh, he has set forth for us, uh, many of us um, have experienced when uh, someone is doing something out of love or they're just doing something out of boasting. and Because you can tell when someone does it out of love rather than necessity or duty. Um, uh, one of the things that we talk about uh, when we're eating is, uh, and the food tastes so good. You know, like, wow, you know, like what ingredients did they put in here to uh, make this food say, taste so good? It's love. Love is the key ingredient for everything that we do. Again, love is the principal thing. I just want us to keep that in the forefront of our mind as we, as we go through this lesson and as we go through our, our Christian journey. Uh, never underestimate the power of love. And it tells us in the first verses, uh, the first verses here, and one of the things that Paul um, was writing to uh, the Corinthians about was um, they had all these spiritual gifts. And one of the spiritual gifts was speaking in, in tongues. But they had become so high-minded high and preferring themselves over, over others, um, forming uh, these cliques that, you know, I'm better than you and you know, you don't have it going on like I do. But God is the God of all. Back in the day, I used to hear people talking about their church and how their church, come on over to our church. You know, our church is Holy Ghost headquarters over there where God is everywhere. Uh, the spirit of God is everywhere. And it, it is love. And so we ought to position ourselves in a way that we esteem others higher than our own selves. Uh, love is powerful in that it gives us peace and it gives us freedom, especially coupled, coupled with forgiveness. Always let your motive be love rather than duty because God is love. Um, when in verse number one, it, it talks about you know, when you're speaking with tongues and um, of men and of angels, you know, and, ha and have not charity, you know, it just becomes sound, uh, just, just, a, just a noisy sound, really. And I remember my, my mother used to use a lot of analogies, um, everyday things that happen, uh, and, and, you know, just to make it relative and bring it home. And one of the things that she used to say is, a empty wagon makes a lot of noise. And if you think about it in your, in your child, if you've seen a child pulling a wagon and the wagon is empty, it does make a lot of noise. But if the wagon is weighted down, if the wagon is, is substantive, you know, it moves a lot quieter. And sometimes we just encounter people like that. And I'm just going to leave that alone right there. 
Now, verse number two. Verse number two says, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding all min, min, mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Now just, just imagine what, what that is saying right now. And we, in, in this sense right here, when we're talking about prophecy, you know, we're in, in today's life, we're talking about preaching. As the pastor is preaching to the people, you know, um, he, he is building the people up or he's, he's edifying the people. And this, was, this, this is what prophecy should be doing. It should be building someone up. But here it says, as described, as it is, it is useless. Prophecy is useless without love. And it goes on to say that when knowledge, and when we're talking about uh, the knowledge here, we're talking about spiritual truthness, spiritual truthness, uh, understanding the deepest ministries, uh, mysteries of God. It really has no value. If it's, if it's not with love, it has no value at all apart from love. And then it goes on to talk about faith. Faith here, we're talking about uh, the gift of the Spirit, in essence. Um, it says, if you have faith great enough to move mountains, think of, let's just think about that for a moment. The faith. You, be, you believe this so much and have so much faith that you believe it to the point that it can remove mountains. But again, Paul, as Paul writing to the Corinthian here, without love, it's meaningless. It is useless. Love is our principal thing. Moving on to number three. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profited me nothing. It profits me nothing. Let's just read, let's just go to the book of Matthews real quick. I really, I know y'all know I, I usually have a lot of scriptures. I don't have that many today. I really don't have that many. Um, let's go to Matthew, the sixth chapter. Verses 1 through 4. Matthew 6, chapter 1 through 4. And, uh, and here, you know, we're talking about, you know, giving to the poor to, uh, to feed them. Let's just read this real quick. Uh, verses one, Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Verse number three. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father, who sees in secret, will in himself reward you openly. Basically here, again, as we have before stated, when, when you're doing something, for someone. Don't do it out of a necessity. Even though it may be a need. And, and, you, and you're doing it because they need. But when you do it. You need to do it. In love. And in a loving manner. Uh, let's see. Uh, one of the examples that I was thinking of, of, about. 
um, earlier. And we'll, we'll actually, we'll get to that later. But look at, um, again, we're still on verse number three here. You know, the verse is talking about bestowing all my goods to feed the poor. And then it go, goes on, you know, just giving, giving of your substance. But not only your substance, but look, look at a little further as we read a little bit further here. And it says, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. So basically, you could be a sacrifice. You can sacrifice your body for whatever. But again, if it's not done in love, it is useless. And, and, and this is the point that we're trying to drive home on this morning, the criticality of love. And I just want to pause here for a moment, moment just, to, just to talk to you. You cannot do it by yourself, the love part. You cannot do it by yourself. When one gives their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, when you come to God and just pour out to God and give your heart, when you repent and, and, and turn away from sin and say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want you to be Lord and Savior over my life. Then the Holy Spirit will come in and take up residence in your heart. So it is something that you're not doing, but it's actually, it's a work of the Holy Spirit that allows you to go out and do the things that's, do the kingdom work uh, that's required, and not only when you do it, uh, you do it in love. In our, um, in our lesson today, at the beginning, in our In Focus a verse when it gives us a story of something that happened. In today's In Focus story, it talked about um, the usher, the head usher, how she was um, uh, rebuked, called into the pastor's office and uh, was rebuked uh, by, the, by the pastor. And uh, let me tell you, that is not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes we can be doing something wrong and, um, and not even know that we're doing something wrong. And, and, and that's one of the parts of being a pastor, you know. We need to let the pastor uh, do his job, what he's supposed to be doing. Uh, the pastor is a, a watchman. He is a shepherd. Um, he is set there by God to, to watch over the flock. And watching over the flock, he sees everything. So when, when he calls you in and say, hey, you know, you, you need to work on this or you, you need to work on that. Don't, don't get mad with the pastor, you know, because as I've already said, we are in a perfecting process. We in our Christian walk, we are we're we're, we're striving or we should be striving to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ, you know. And if someone points something out to you um, that is a flaw or shortcoming or, or whatever it, it may be, uh, take it in love. Because when the pastor calls you, the he or she, they're going to do it in love. That's just God has put them over the flock, and, and that's what they do. So let the pastors do what they do. Don't be getting mad at the pastors. Uh, again, giving one's own body it, body is worthless uh, without love. Let me just read um, a, a little bit right here, verse uh, about verse number three right here. Uh, again, we're talking about the body and uh, giving the body to be burned. It said, Paul is referring to the ultimate in self-sacrifice. But even of the most extreme act of sacrifice is worth nothing if we do it so we can boast about our own spirituality. Nothing we do is worth anything if our actions are not guided by genuine love for other people. And, and that's basically the same thing we, 
uh, just went over in Matthew uh, chapter number six there. We have to do it in love. Uh, going to verse number four. Uh, uh, there's an A part, a B part, and a C part. Uh, let's just take it one part at a time. Um, where, where it says, let's just do the first part of verse number four. It says, charity suffereth long and is kind. Getting back to what I was getting ready to refer to earlier. That as we're reading these scriptures, I just, I just want, I, I want you to, to, to really soak in what, what we're actually talking about. So let's just read verse number four, the A part, one more time. Charity, again, the charity, we're, we're talking about love. Uh, just if it's confusing you, just uh, depends on what version, a uh, good version, uh, the New Living Translation is a good version to use. But we're in the King James Version on today. Um, I have the New King James Version here, and it does use the word uh Love, But for Sunday school purposes, we're coming out of the New King James Version. Charity, or love suffereth long, and is kind. And uh, one, of the, one of the thoughts that came to my mind when I seen this is, you know, the mother, um, you know, she has the two children there, uh, but they're not really getting along. And and one snatches the toy, you know, and don't want to, and don't want to uh, share the toy with the other child. And the mother comes and makes the child give it. Let share your toy. Let them have it. You have another one right there. Let them have it. And the child kind of shoves it. So the, the child reluct reluctantly gives up. Uh, uh, the toy. And it, we know it's not out of love. It, it's out of necessity not to get a whipping is, is what that is right there. So when we do something for one another, it needs to be done out of love. And, and not necessarily out of, you know, hey, I'm going to get in trouble or uh, I want somebody to see what I'm doing. It, it should not be that way. Um, here, Paul describes love is not an emotion, but rather a lifestyle. Uh, and he says here, he says, suffereth long. Does not mean that loving always brings pain, but rather emphasizes that love does not express itself through vengeance, retaliation, or by giving up on people quickly. Here, another thing that I, I thought about here, um, the parent, um, especially um, the love of the, of the mother, of a, of, of a mother. Um, love is an action word. Here, I thought about when a parent, and especially a mother, um, when a child is going wayward and the relationship becomes strained between uh, the parent and the child, no matter what that child does, um, that mother is always standing with, with open arms, you know. So that love, it is long-suffering. The love that God has towards us, it is long-suffering. No matter how many times we mess up, God is always standing there with arms wide open, waiting to take us back. Even in the story of the prodigal son, how the son went and asked for his inheritance early. Uh, the Bible says he, he took his inheritance and he went to a foreign land. 
And in that foreign land, uh, he lived riotously, the Bible, how the Bible puts it. Um, so he, he was living uh, recklessly, uh, without care. And then when all of his substance was gone, you know, he, he thought to himself, you know, now, my father, back home, my father has hired hands that's living better than I am right now. So he thought to himself, you know what, I'm going to get myself together. And I'm going to go back home. And so he did just that. And on his way back home, his father seen him afar off. And, and welcomed him with open arms. That is the kind of loving God that, that we have. And, and, and that love that we're talking about, as we've already said, is that agape love. Unconditional. No matter what, you know. He, God is always there. Waiting, you know to receive us back when, when we've done wrong. And there's no sense in acting all holy and almighty, you know, because Romans 3 and 23, the Bible done told on us already, for all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. So when, when we find ourselves in that falling short period or moment, that is not the time to run away from God. But that, that is actually the time to run to God, knowing that he is a loving God and that he is a forgiving God and he is long-suffering. Moving on to the uh, part B, verse 4b. Charity envieth not. Again, we're talking about love. So we say, love envieth not. And sometimes we, uh, uh, and there is a distinction between jealousy and envy. There is a distinction between the two. And sometimes I know that we kind of, kind of use them interchangeably sometimes. But here's what here's what we got right here. It says, though we use the two words very similarly, jealousy and envy have distinct meanings throughout the Bible. Jealousy is often a strong desire to protect a faithful, committed relationship. The Bible sometimes refers to God as jealous in his love for his people because he desires them to be faithful to him. Envy is a desire to obtain what other people have, often accompanied by feelings of bitterness or hatred. Envy and covetousness are never motivated by genuine love. That genuine and love, that genuine love is not going to hate on you. That genuine love, you know, is going to, when you celebrate, it's going to celebrate with you. Verse 4c. Charity vaunteth not itself is not puffed up. Again, uh, uh, Paul is writing these, writing these verses to the people at Corinth. And it, it says, at the, at the same time, a person who loves does not try to make other people envious by, by bragging about the things that he or she has. Loving people are not prideful and do not seek to draw attention to what God has given them. Paul was thinking here especially of the pride that people might take in their spiritual gifts, since all gifts are given by the same spirit and all are of equal importance to the church. It is senseless to boast about them or to envy that what someone else uh, has received. I just want to read verse, uh, let's go to Romans 5, verses 6 through 8. Romans 5, verses 6 through 
Romans 5, verses 6 through 8. And it reads, For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Again, we're talking about that love uh, that God has for us. And it, it is actually um, through the spirit that we, that we have that kind of love. And as, and as Christians, uh, follow, again, followers of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, let's, let's see here what Jesus is saying here. In John 13, John chapter 13, verses 35, verse number 35. John chapter 13, verse number 35. And it says, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Think about that. Jesus, because the letters are in red, so it is Jesus. He's saying that, you know, people will know who you are, you know, if you have love for one another. And a few well, but basically about a year ago now, um, when we were talking about the Beatitudes, um, um, in that, we were talking about the Christian being salt, the Christians being light. And, and that is one of our responsibilities, uh, to, be to be salt and to be light in this dark world for one another. Because... You've experienced this. I've experienced this. Um, you know, you, you're just going about your day-to-day -day business. You know, you're just doing what you do. But other people are noticing what you are doing. And sometimes they'll come up to you and, um, and make a comment about that. And you're thinking to yourself, like, I you know, I'm, you know, you think it to yourself, I'm just doing, I didn't do nothing spectacular, you know, I'm just doing what I do. That just goes to show you no matter what you're doing, people are always watching and we should always um, be edifying uh, to the body of Christ. We, we should always um, be light. Moving on to verse number five now. Does not behave itself unseemly. Still talking about love here, you know. Does not behave itself unseemly. It, love is not all out of sorts, you know. Um, love is, 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 is kind, that we, what we just said in verse number four. Uh, love, love is patient. Here, Paul emphasizes four things that people driven by love will not um, Paul, he and he's he, he's um, advised unmarried men not to act uncom uncomely by failing to honor a commitment to marry. Love does not lead us to do anything that we would would be ashamed of later. Following from verse number four, what we just read, Paul was probably thinking of envious or prideful things that we might say. So basically, um, when you have love for people, when you have love for others, um, you're not going to do anything to shame them, uh, to uh, make them feel uncomfortable. Um, if something is amiss, if something is wrong, the way that you would handle that, you would take that person, the loving way to do it is take that person to a, a side, you and the individual, and, and address to issue that way. Not to put them on blast, not to put them out on, 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 on front street, but do it in love. The B part of verse number five, seeketh not her own. 
Here it says, pride and envy are categorically eliminated by the fact that love is not selfish, but instead is always acting in the best interest of others. Again, we should esteem others above our own selves. And number 5C says, uh, still talking about love here, it is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Love is not expressed in a hot temper. Of course, we may be angry at the sins that people commit and may be frustrated by their poor choices, but these feelings should be motivated by the genuine concern that the person is doing something harmful to himself, others, or the cause of Christ. For this reason, love is quick to forgive. Think of no evil. Here means that we should not continue to harbor ill feelings toward those who make us angry. Instead, we should forgive what needs forgiving and forget the small stuff. Let's just pause right here to kind of let that sink in, especially that last part um, when it says, thinketh no evil. When someone wrongs us, um, we should not be keeping a record of that. We need to forgive. We must forgive because God has also forgiven us of our sins. And I heard, you know, I hear people say, well, I'm going to forgive, but I ain't going to forget people. <laughs> Thank God that God is such a God of love that when we sin, he, he, he takes that sin, and when we repent, he takes that sin and puts that sin in the sea of forgetfulness, and he remembers it no more. Again, like we stated earlier in, in, our, in, in, in the beginning, Again, at the beginning, when I told you how powerful love is, and you cannot do it under your own strength, but it comes through the Spirit of God. And with that, uh, that love, I'm going to read it to you again. When we forgive, it, that love, that powerful love, it gives us peace and freedom, especially coupled with forgiveness. So when, when someone um, has done you wrong, you know, and you should forgive them, when you truly forgive them because you have the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, that is, that's actually a relief to you. It is a burden that's actually lifted off of you. And you can go home at night and, and just lay your head on the, on the piddle on the pillow and sleep to your heart's content because you are at peace. You have done uh, what the Bible has required to you for you to do through the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number six. Rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoice in truth. In this verse number six here, um, let's just substitute that word iniquity for the word uh, unjust or unjust or unjust. Um, here it says, many of the Corinthian Christians seem to have been arrogant about their spiritual gifts. We can easily become envious of and resentful towards arrogant people. And we may feel gratified to see them do something wrong because this justifies our judgmental attitude. Real love, however, always wants to see people succeed and do the right thing. Again, this love is powerful. It says it rejoices not in iniquity, you know. Here, the, the Corinthians, they were um, 
And Paul was writing to them for correction. Writing to them, you know, about the things that, you know, hey, you need to get this together, you know. You shouldn't be all high-minded and, and especially being boastful of all this sin you're doing, all the uh, iniquity you're doing. That is nothing to be bragging about, but you should be repent repenting. Now, going to number seven. Beareth all things. Believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Here um, we see that this, this verse highlights four ways that loving person treats others with the repetition, with the repetition of all things, stressing that we are to act this way. No matter what other people do, love does not break under pressure, but instead always bears up. Believe it and hope it. Do not mean that loving people are naive, but rather that love always remains positive. This attitude tempered by the fact that love also endures, far from wearing rose-colored glasses, loving people will see the reality of situation and choose to love anyway. So, again, we're, we're still talking, and that is still talking about um, endurance, long suffering, loving your way through this through the situation. And if we are to bring anyone to Christ, like I said earlier, people are watching us. If we are to bring anyone to Christ, it has to be through love. Especially when you're in a situation where people are watching you and the situations are challenging for you. You, you have to love your way through the situation. Um, you should not break down under the, the, the pressure um, you should not strike back, but rather love. Um, because, you know, we talked about that in, uh, again, our devotion of reading. Um, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. It, God says he will repay. That's not for you to do. Your job is to stand on the word of God and edify others, to be salt in life to others. That's your job. And if, if I promise you, if you do what you're supposed to do, God is going to do what he said he would do. Verse number eight. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall uh, uh, vanish away. Again. Again, we're talking about the power, how powerful love really is. And, and we, I, I just really want us to really just soak this in today. This, this is such a powerful um, lesson, you know. And, and it, this is all about our walk with Christ here. The love that we should have for one another. Because love, it will never fail. No matter how the situation looks, no matter how you feel, love will never fail. But again, it goes on to say, where there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there should be knowledge, it shall all vanish away. So all that other stuff, it really don't matter. The only thing that really matters is love. And just, just following the word of God. And we know that Jesus, uh, he, he is the word. And, and he, he became flesh. Jesus is the word. The, the logos. He is the word. So, and God says in his word, before one jot or one tittle of my word fails, heaven and earth shall pass away. One job 
or one tittle, just any little bit of part fails. He said, before that happens, heaven and earth will pass away. And we know that Jesus is love. So in all this other stuff, it's, it's going to pass away. But that love, it will never fail. Moving on to verse number nine. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Right now living, today, at present, our knowledge of God is limited. God is so great, so far beyond human comprehension, that it would be impossible for hu any human being to know all there is to know about him. Indeed, human language could not express all that he is in our in our finite minds could never fully grasp his perfection and holiness. As such, even prophecy can provide only a partial knowledge of God. Any person who takes pride in knowledge should realize that he or she does not know everything. And now, I don't know about you, but the older I get, and day by day, I realize how much I really don't know. Um, we use the expression, I, I thought I've seen it all, but I keep on living. Verse number 10, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. Think about that. But when that which is perfect is come, that perfect, that when that is complete, when that is which is done is come. Then that which is in part or that which is lacking, that which is undone, shall be done away with. Uh, this verse reads like a proverb, a general statement uh, about how things work in this world. Perfect here has a sense of of maturity, lacking nothing. As a rule, things that are lacking become obsolete as soon as the full package becomes available. Isn't that something right there? I mean, that which is perfect is come. That which is in part shall be done away with. And verse, uh, moving on to verse number 11, it says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. On this Christian journey, as we progress through this journey, and it is a perfecting process, um, things that we did yesterday we, and we come into a knowledge, as we come, become more in a, a knowledge of God, uh, we should learn from the errors of our ways. Um, I heard somebody say, but when you know better, you should do better. And, and, this is, is, and this is part of what verse number uh, 11 is saying. When as a child, you know, a child really, they don't they know no better, you know. But as they growing up, you know, uh, they, they understand at the level that they're on. But at a certain point, maturity should come, and, and you should put away those childish things, those things that are not, as a Christian, those things that are not edifying uh, to the body of believers and those things that do not glorify God. They, those things should be done away with. Not, not put away, you know, not stand down and stand by, they should be done away with. Verse number 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but when we went, but then face to face, now I know in part. But then shall I know even as I also am known. Right here, um, Paul says, Paul anticipated a time seen face to face. Scholars have various theories regarding what Paul was referring to. One theory is given with verse 10. Another theory is that Paul was thinking of the second coming. 
Yet another proposes that Paul will refer more generally to life in heaven where we will dwell in God's presence and behold his perfect glory. Moving on to verse number 13. And now abideth faith. This is our focal verse now. This, this, this is it right here. This is it. Verse number 13. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Now, uh, hope. Hope here, hope is not wishful thinking, but rather confident expectation. Hope will be out of place when we reach heaven because as Paul acts theoretically, hope that is seen is not hope for what a man seeth. Why does he yet hope for? If you can see it, what, what, if it's right there for you, basically, why are you hoping for it? It's already there. He says, but love will never be obsolete. It will continue to characterize our relationship with God and other redeemed saints forever. Love is therefore the greatest because it never ends. As such, when we exercise our gifts in a spirit of love, we are acting with eternity in view. Uh, this concludes the reading of our, our lessons on today but I always like to leave you with a golden nugget in, in today's golden nugget we're going to answer an age old question and that age old question is what love got to do with it what's love got to do with it as we have read in our lesson on today love has everything to do with with it. Let us pray. Father God, we just come now in the name of Jesus, oh God. Oh God, we just asking uh, you, God, to, to help us, oh God, to be truly loving and forgiving people, oh God. We're asking, oh, oh God, that you would give us wisdom to use our gifts, Lord God, that you have given us, oh God. Oh God, let, them, let us use it in humility, oh God, for your glory and your honor, Lord. Oh, God, we just bless you, Lord God. We just lift you up and we magnify you, oh, God. Let your word, oh, God, pierce our hearts and our minds, God. And we just ask, oh, God, that it be all of you and none of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Truth and Triumph is God's ultimate plan for our lives. The Bell Grove Missionary Baptist Church, 2300 Edgefield, Highway North, Aiken, South Carolina, invites you to join us every Sunday for a Truth and Triumph worship experience. Pastor Lester A. Smalls is a man with a testimony who preaches and teaches the gospel of Jesus Christ with such soundness and clarity even a baby can understand it. Seeking true worship, great fellowship, and sound doctrine? Join us at Bell Grove. We're located in North Aiken County. We are also convenient to the surrounding cities of Edgefield, Johnston, Ridge Springs, and North Augusta. Worship every Sunday with Sunday School at 9.30 a.m., Devotion and Praise at 10.30 a.m., and Call to Worship at 11 a.m. Also, join us.